Good evening, church. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. May I share a verse with you? Yes, sir. 2 Kings 3.15, just briefly. You have your Bibles, I hope. Thank you, Lord. Help me turn right to it. I know a lot of prayer has been uh, prayed and we just, uh, we, we need the Lord tonight, don't we? We need the, the word of the Lord. We need God's word. And um, I just wanted to point out this one verse, especially for you musicians out there. And uh, it, 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 it says here in verse 15, um, Elisha is asked to give a word. And he's brought before these three kings to give the word of the Lord. But before he can give this word of the Lord, look at what he, he asks. But now, what? Bring me, it says, a minstrel or a musician. Why? Then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. There's something about the music that brings God close and brings revelation close. That brings an open heaven. Isn't that what we want tonight? We want communion with the Father and the Son. And we want to commune and fellowship in the Holy Spirit. And so all that singing and praising gets us to the place where our spirit can receive the word of the Lord. You know that song, Spirit of the Living God? Would you sing that with me? Spirit of the Living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the Living God, fall fresh on me. Man on your heart tonight, Lord. What is it that you want to share with us tonight, Lord? Let the Holy Spirit move in our midst, Lord. Let him lead us. Let him guide us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. It's always good for us to come and visit with, with you folk. It, it, you're such a blessing uh, to Stephanie and I because you have God in you. You have Jesus Christ in you. I see him in you. I see the sparkle in your eye. I see the love of Christ in you. And so when I was asked to come down, and, uh, and I, th I said, yeah, I, I want to go down, Brother Harold. I, 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 wanna, I haven't visited this church in years. It might be 10, 12 years since we've been here. And I began to ask the Lord, what is it that, that you want us to do, Lord, here? And I, I prayed for the word. And... Um, I believe the Lord has given me his word for tonight, his word for tonight. Um, and so, you know, as I have been talking to you all, I just felt like there's a need for all of us to be encouraged in the Lord. There, we need to be energized in the Lord. We need to have a spirit of grace and supplication moving upon us. We need to have a spirit of joy with us so that we can just be elevated and up because we see what's going on in the world and that can bring us down. And so the first thing the Lord wants me to say is, is that there's power in the word of God. Amen. The word of the Lord is living and it is active. Yes. And when we open up this book and we read the words of this book, there's a power in this word that gets into us that increases our faith that develops, I was reading Andrew Murray, and he said, he said that re the word of God has the power to create an atmosphere around us. Sort of like what, like a, a diver going into the water, sort of like an astronaut going out into space, that there's something about the word of God 
that begins to create an atmosphere around us where the Holy Spirit is, where the love of God abides, where the angels are around us. So we kind of walk around the world in this spiritual bubble, if you will, this own atmosphere that has been created by the Word of God. I want that kind of atmosphere around me. And be careful that we don't let other atmospheres invade this. But uh, as I think about the word, you know, I think about how Jesus used the word as he faced his great enemy. Remember when the enemy came to him and he said, man shall not live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Man must live by, I'm sorry, man must not live by bread alone, but he must live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I'll get that right. And so, what I want to ask you tonight is, how do you know that the Bible is the Word of God? How do you know that this book was inspired by God? How do you know some men just did decide to start writing up stories and legends and, and, and writing up these things? How do we know? That this book is really the word of God. Has God done anything to validate this book that we can know for a certainty, for sure, that this book is from God? And I'll tell you what it is for me. God has put in this book prophecy. Jesus says, I tell you in Matthew, and sorry, in John uh, uh, 1429, he said, I tell you before it happens what will happen so that when it happens, you might believe. Okay? So God has put in this book so many prophecies that came to pass that validates this book as the word of God. You can take Daniel 2, for instance. Daniel 2 in Daniel 2, God gives a vision to Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar sees this great image. You'll recall the prophecy. And God says, I'm going to tell you the future of the whole world until the coming of Christ. What a tremendous prophecy that is. That Babylon would be conquered by Medo-Persia. Medo-Persia would be conquered by Greece. Greece would be conquered by Rome. And then Rome would dissolve in all, all the different nation states of the world. And then, when it was in this iron and clay state, like it is now, by the way, a rock formed not by any man's hands comes crashing down and crushed the image into dust and rose up like a great mountain. And this kingdom would reign forever and ever. That was given 600 years before Christ. 2,600 years ago, that was given. God says, I want you to know that this book is from me. Right. And then he gave Daniel 9. He said, 70 weeks are determined upon your people. And just at the very right time, after the 69th week, in about AD 27, Jesus Christ, in fulfillment of that prophecy, came to Israel and was baptized by John. And then in the midst of the week, he was cut off. God wants us to believe this book is from him. And you can go into the Old Testament and you'll find 300 prophecies concerning the Messiah about what would happen when he came. So those who want to look at this book and say this is not the word of God, they just have not looked at the prophecies of the scripture. When you go into the Old Testament, you find a lot of Old Testament characters and events actually prophetic of things that would happen. Like Joseph, for instance, he was put into the pit, as it were, dead. And then he rises to life again, to sit at the right hand of Pharaoh in Egypt, feeding the world the bread of life. Who does that remind you of? Jonah goes into the belly of the whale, three days and three nights, and comes out. What does that remind us of? Israel goes into the wilderness for 40 years. And then enters into the promised land. <clears throat> That's a picture of the church. So there are all these characters and all these events in the Old Testament that God had happen in just a certain way because he wanted it to be a prophecy of what would happen in the future. It's a wonderful study if you can get something like that, like that teaches us um, Jesus in the Old Testament. 
the prophecies of Christ in the Old Testament. It's a wonderful study. And I want us to look at one this evening. If you'll turn with me to John chapter 8. The Gospel of John chapter 8. We find Jesus here talking to the Pharisees, the Jews, the clergy of the day. All right, and we'll start in um, verse 39. There they say to Jesus, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, <laughs> a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You don't do the works of Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. And they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. What were they accusing Jesus of? You know, just being born of Mary, but where's your father? So they were questioning the birth of Jesus. All right. So Jesus has something to say about that. Verse 42, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from him. I have, uh, nor have I come of myself, but he has sent me. Why do you not understand my speaking? Because you are not able to listen to my word. Okay, he's telling them, here's why you're not able. You're of your father, the devil. You have, you have no love for me, so you're not going to listen to me. You're going to oppose me. So now I want us to, to slip over here to... Uh, uh, verse 54, Jesus answered and said, um, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It's my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he's your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him, and I do keep his word. Now look at verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. So here he's telling them, you claim to be of your father Abraham. Well, if, if, if you were really of your father Abraham, you would rejoice to see me because he did. And it says he saw me when? In his day, he saw me and he was glad. He rejoiced to see my day. So <clears throat> there's something if uh, we go back to Genesis 22 where we see this, uh, this story here of when Abraham saw Christ. When did Abraham see Christ? When did Abraham rejoice? When did Abraham see his day? And I believe the main thing that caused him to rejoice and to see the day of Christ was when Isaac was born. Sarah had a miraculous birth at the age of 90. And they both rejoiced because they just realized this is totally a God thing. And so when, a, when Isaac was born, they named that child Isaac for the purpose because of what its name represented. Isaac means laughter. So when Isaac was born, they rejoiced because in Isaac they saw all the, se the seed would eventually come from the seed of Isaac and that through him, salvation would come to the world. Now here we are in chapter 22 of Genesis. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Who does that remind you of? Who, take your only son. God had only one son. And he was God's beloved son. And his name was Jesus. And so he's beginning to paint a prophetic picture now through Abraham as he tests him. He's going to allow Abraham, listen, to stand for the father in heaven. Isaac's going to represent Jesus. And they're going to go to this place. Let's, let's listen to what he says. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there 
as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham, on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place from afar off. Now, I don't know how he knew. It doesn't say God gave him that revelation, but he, as he got to this place where God was leading him, God must have convicted him. That's the place. And he saw it from afar, and what did he see? Well, when you look at the topography of that area, there was three hills. You had the Mount of Olives. You have Mount, actually, it's not pr pronounced Moriah, it's pronounced Moriah. And then there was the third hill, Mount Zion, okay? So when he looked from the distance and he saw these three hills, he saw that highest peak on Mount Moriah. Moriah, Moriah. I have to learn how to say that right. I just learned, I just had to have, I had to look up the pronunciation. And as I looked it up, realized I've been pronouncing it wrong all this time. It's Moriah because Yah is the word for God. Moriah means chosen by God. And as I looked at that, I thought to myself, I looked at that and I said, how did it get named Moriah, chosen by God? Who named it? Abraham came, just got there. We don't know who named that land. We know Melchizedek was in that land. We don't even know how Melchizedek got there. And so he sees the place from afar off. Notice the, the emphasis on the place of which God had told him. He saw the place from afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. Look at the faith of Abraham. He was told to offer up his only begotten son as a burnt sacrifice, and yet something within him said, I don't know how God's going to do this, but we're going to end up coming back. Okay? So he's rejoicing, I think, in a way, because he's, he's looking at what God's up to here, and he says this to them, and then it says in verse 6, So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. And I, as I looked at that, I thought, this is a picture of the father and the son going to Calvary, going to Golgotha. And when Jesus went to the cross, he didn't go alone, did he? He went with the father with him. As you and I are traveling this weary land, headed for the promised land, we can know that our father is with us, that Jesus is with us. We're not going alone, friend. We're going in fellowship and communion with the Father and the Son and His people. So they go together and they leave the other two behind. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, <clears throat> Dad, my father, he said, here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire in the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Again, it's mentioned. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And so he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, that you're willing to do whatever I asked you to do. Do you and I have that kind of reverence before God? Do we fear the Lord? Do we hold him in such awesome reverence that even though we may not understand it, I'm going to go and do what you're asking me to do. Now I know. But I think God knew all along. I think when it says he tested Abraham, he knew how Abraham was going to respond, don't you? I don't think there was any question about what was going to happen. We see it in the way Abraham's responding here. He says his faith was completed. His faith was finished. 
God's at work in you and me to do of his good pleasure. God has begun a good work in us, and it says in Philippians 1, 6, he will finish that work in you and me. Just like he finished it in Abraham, and if we're Abraham's children, he's going to finish our faith to the point where if it means laying our life down, if it means being sick at the end of our life and having to go through a terrible thing like that to get into the kingdom of God, we're going to have the faith to handle that, even though we don't understand why certain things happen to us. Verse 13, then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horn. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day in the mountain of the Lord it shall be provided. Okay, so Abraham has, has found that God has provided a sacrifice for his son and what is God trying to tell the ancient Hebrew people is that one day there would be a sacrifice. There would be something provided to save them and their children from death. That God was going to provide a lamb. Now, I want us to go back to verse 8 because Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb. And as I looked at that, the Lord quickened this to me, that he provided the lamb not for Abraham, but for who? For himself. <laughs> Abraham prophesied God is going to provide a lamb for himself. And that is at the very heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What do I mean? It's because God knew that he had to satisfy himself in order to forgive sinners. And how is God going to forgive sinners unless his justice is satisfied on our behalf? And so there's a word in the New Testament that's used by both Paul and John, propitiation, that was used to describe how God had to satisfy himself. Because God desires to be merciful to you and me. I mean, when he revealed himself to Moses, when he had him in the cleft of the rock and he showed Moses his glory, he said to Moses, I am gracious, I'm compassionate, I'm long-suffering, slow to anger, patient, I abound in loving kindness, I abound in faithfulness. I'm merciful, forgiving every manner of sin, iniquity, and transgression. And we all like that about God, don't we? We want him to be gracious, compassionate, patient with us. We want him to abound in kindness and favor and grace towards us. We want him to be faithful to us, and we extol his faithfulness. And when we go to him to be forgiven, we expect full forgiveness for everything and anything. Amen. Praise God. I like that all about God. But the last thing he said to Moses there in the cleft of the rock was, I will not let the guilty go unpunished. That's the justice of God. And there are many theologians and many preachers who don't want to touch the justice of God. That there's something within God where he wants to be compassionate, but he also has to be just. That's why Paul says, God designed in his great wisdom the cross so he could be both just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus Christ. So he could satisfy himself. He gave the lamb. He, in order to satisfy himself, God will provide a lamb for himself. And that's what it says in Isaiah 53.10. It pleased God to do it this way. To have himself take on flesh. And go to the cross. So he could be compassionate and gracious and I, I I just love how he he says here to Abraham he says in verse uh, 16 by myself I have sworn says the Lord because you've done this thing you've not withheld your son your only son blessing I will bless you multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and of the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies so he's saying I'm going to bless you I'm going to multiply you. And so it is with all the children of Abraham, that's you and me, that if we trust in what God has done on the cross to satisfy his justice on our behalf, 
so that we can experience his compassions and his graciousness and his mercies and his patience. God says, because you've accepted my son and believed that I took care of your sin debt at the cross, because you believe that I provided the lamb to satisfy myself at the cross, I will bless you. You please me because you believe in my son and have received my son. Now I want to go back to this mountain, Moriah. Because it's mentioned only one other time in the scripture. Let's go there. 2 Chronicles 3 verse 1. Y'all with me out there? You're awful quiet out there. <laughs> says now, in verse 1, Now Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Where? On Mount Mor Moriah. <laughs> Bear with me. You know, you can learn things. Probably till the day you die, we're going to learn things about the scriptures. I praise God for that, by the way. But here you are on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David at that place that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Ornan and the Jebusite. And he began to build on the second day of the second month of the fourth year of his reign. Began to build the temple of God. Where? On Mount Moriah. Why? Because God, in his sovereign wisdom, decided from the foundation of the world where he was going to sacrifice himself for the sin of the whole world. It was on Mount Moriah. Chosen of God. And so when it came time to build the temple, where was it built? On Mount Moriah. And so Solomon built this beautiful temple on that same mountain where Abraham offered up his son. Or actually, the lamb, not his son. Where the substitution took place between Abraham and his son. And now God was setting the stage for the day when he would send his only begotten son to be the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And we know that when Jesus came, that he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We know that it was prophesied in the sanctuary that a lamb would be slain when? At 9 a.m. and at 3 p.m. When did Christ die on the cross? 9 a.m. He was hung on the cross and he died at 3 p.m. That was prophetic. See what I mean about the prophetic nature of the word of God, how it validates that God has given us this book? God, from the time the, uh, the, the sanctuary service was established, turned it into a great prophecy of Christ. Everything about the sanctuary pointed to Christ. And at the center of the nation of Israel... At the center of this worship was the slain lamb where the sinner could find forgiveness of sin. And so God gave Solomon and, and the Israelite people seven feasts, which in themselves are prophecies. Remember when Christ was crucified? I mean, you look at the first four feasts, Passover. He died as the Passover lamb on the very day of Passover. The next day he was buried on the... Feast of Unleavened Bread on Saturday. And then Sunday he came alive again on the Feast of First Fruits. They were all a prophecy of what God was going to do when you look at the feast. Praise God. Amen. And then as he, as he rose from the dead, which was the First Fruits, fulfilling those three feasts, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, they were all fulfilled on the very day that they celebrated. All the Jews were there that day. And then 50 days later, what happened? Pentecost, the fourth feast, was prophesied that this would, the grain harvest, the first harvest, would, uh, would come in. And the Holy Spirit came down so that the church could harvest those who believe in the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. But when you go back and you see Jesus Christ coming into Jerusalem, <clears throat> even though he was crucified on the 14th of Nisan, it was on the 10th of Nisan, four days before that, when the high priest would leave the temple and he would go to the, 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 sheep, the sheep pen and pick out a lamb that would be slain on the Passover. And they would make a big deal about that. 
all the Jews would gather in Jerusalem three times a year. They would gather on, Pente on, on Pentecost, they would gather on Passover, on Pentecost, and then they would gather on the Feast of Tabernacles in the fall. Three main times that they, all the devout Jews gathered. So they were all there. Over a million Jews were in Jerusalem when Jesus came into that city as the Lamb of God. But what the Lord showed me is that on that tenth day, when the high priest left the temple in a wonderful procession to go get the Lamb, the Jews made a big deal about that. And they would hang all over the roofs. They knew the route, and they were all there like a big parade. And they watched the high priest, and they watched the procession as he went to the sheep pen. And they would have their palms, and they would all be waving them that day. Yeah, he's going to get the, the lamb. We're going we're gonna to have Passover. And then they would watch him come back with the lamb, and they'd even make a bigger, bigger deal. He found the lamb. He's got the lamb. But on that day when he went to go get the lamb, as they waited for the high priest to come back, here comes a man riding on a donkey. <laughs> here comes the real lamb of God. The whole thing that that symbolized and prophesied. Here comes Jesus. And they're like, well, what's this? Who is this riding on a donkey down where the high priest is supposed to be with a, with a lamb? Because he was the lamb of God. And they were waving Hosanna in there. He had all his followers saying Hosanna and laying down. The... And so here comes the Lamb of God to offer up his life. And that leads to the next point that I want to make that just thrills my soul. And that is that Jesus was not only the Lamb of God, he came as the high priest to offer up himself. <laughs> he, was, he was of the order of Melchizedek. And you can read in, 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 in Hebrews. I'll just go and, uh, and read this if you want to turn there with me just for a moment. Let's go to uh, <clears throat> Hebrews 7, verse uh, 27. Or I'll start in verse 26. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who was holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he did what? He offered up himself. Now... <coughs> Late in, in my ministry, I learned why Jesus was baptized. John the Baptist was a son of Zechariah, a high priest of the order of Aaron, and his wife also. Zechariah's wife, Elizabeth, was also of Aaron's line. And so John the Baptist was, was born to be a priest of the, of the Levite order. And he was actually, in God's eyes, the last of the Levitical priesthood. And so when they went killing the, the infants, I believe Zechariah, his father, was killed. That's is another story. Because Jesus said from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, I believe that's who it was talking about. When, when Herod found out that this special birth had taken place, they questioned Zechariah, and I believe he was slaughtered, killed, because he wouldn't tell where his son went, and his son had to go into the wilderness. So here you have a man born of the Levitical priesthood, John, Okay, coming forth at the age of 30, which was required of a priest, baptizing, and then Jesus comes along. And when John sees Jesus, now John was filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. But when Jesus came along, he saw someone much greater, and he knew. God spoke to him. He said, I, I was told from heaven that when I see this man, that I would know him and that I was to baptize him. But he didn't want to baptize Jesus. He said, you're greater than me. You need to baptize me, Jesus. He saw the holiness on Jesus. He saw the, 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 just the, the light that was on Christ because he had the Holy Spirit without measure. He had that atmosphere. <laughs> he had God all in him and around him, okay? And so Jesus says, no, we have to fulfill all righteousness. 
What was he saying? I now need to be washed. I need to wash like the priests wash to enter into the priesthood. I am now here to enter into the order of Melchizedek. Baptize me because I'm now coming as a priest because I've come to offer up myself as the Lamb of God. So Christ on the cross was, was both priest and sacrifice, offering up himself. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Don't you love prophecy? Amen. And you know what? Abraham saw his day too because he saw Melchizedek. Genesis 14, remember the story after he slaughtered the kings and he saved Lot and he saw King the king of Salam, Shalom, the king of peace, the, which became Shalom, Jerusalem. And he bowed and gave him his 10%. But it says Melchizedek came with what? Bread and wine. It's prophetic of what Jesus would bring to the world, his broken body and his poured out blood that would atone for our sins. So you have uh, this, this emphasis on Melchizedek. And, um, and Jesus there on the cross. And so you have this place. And so Jesus is there to offer up himself in Jerusalem. And so what does he do on the 14th of Nisan? He's taken in the middle of the night so the people don't get upset about this. Because everyone was all excited about Jesus. And they had him hanging on the cross by 9 o'clock the next morning. Before the people hardly had their coffee before they even knew what was going on. Here was a man hanging on the cross. Nighttime trials, that, that wasn't permitted, but there was our Lord hanging on the cross. They put him on the cross. And where did they put him on the cross? They took him out of the city, and they took him to, let's look, John 14. I'm sorry, John 19. You know where he went. <clears throat> Verse 17. And he bearing his cross went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now, when you ask, where is Golgotha, the place of the skull where he was crucified? That was north of the temple where Solomon built the temple on Mount Moriah. There was the, the, the very place where Abraham offered up his son. And listen, my friends, that's the very same place where Jesus offered up his life as the Lamb of God. That place called Golgotha was higher than even the city of Jerusalem, even higher than the temple. It was at the high point of that mountain. That's why it was a hill called Calvary. Calvary is just a Latin name for a Golgotha. And when General Gordon in the 1800s, when the, when, the, when the English defeated the Ottoman Empire and General Gordon went into Palestine, he could see the face of the skull. Maybe you've seen that. You can go and say... Just Google Golgotha, and you'll see the face of a cliff that looks like a skull. The nose has been broken off since, but you can still make it out. And there's been some excavations where they believe the Roman cross holes are right there in front of that skull. That's where our Lord and Savior was crucified, the very place where God knew. That's the place our God chose to be crucified. And he prophesied it almost 2,000 years earlier in the life of Abraham. This Bible is the, is, is the word of God for that to happen like that. And so those first four feasts were fulfilled, church, but there's still three more. The Day of Atonement, the, well, actually the first is the, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and then the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths. And it's interesting that Revelation emphasizes those three feasts. John, in his gospel, 
emphasizes the first four, and then in Revelation, the last three are emphasized, which is to say, Jesus, after he offered up himself and rose from the dead, he ascended up into heaven, where he is now ministering as our high priest, is he not? He's after the order of Melchizedek. And he is, he is looking for sinners that will come to him, confessing their sins, because through the shed blood of his, of his death, he forgives us of our sins. Though our sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson. He has an ability and a power to take the stain of sin and the guilt of sin and the shame of sin and the condemnation of sin, which is in our mind and our heart and our soul, and He takes it all away. Praise the Lord. Amen. So that we experience a fullness of forgiveness. Praise God. Only Jesus can forgive sins. Hallelujah. And he's there now ministering as our high priest. That's what the book of Hebrews is all about. After the order of Melchizedek. And all who come to him can be forgiven. And so when we, we look at Revelation. Chapter 5. I just, I just love this because in chapter 5, we're just going to briefly just look at this in verse 6. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood what? A lamb, as though it had been slain. Hallelujah. Everything that John's going to say about Jesus, he likes to use that he's the lamb. He's the lamb that died for our sins. And then he goes over here and he says uh, in verse uh, 12, Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and glory and honor and blessing. <clears throat> And then this is the one where we're supposed to sing this in verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth, that's us, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power to be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Now, I just want to close by saying this. I've... Uh, been doing a lot of reading on the Midnight Cry site, Brother Thomas, Brother Phil, and this, uh, the Midnight Cry um, message that was given to Brother Thomas. Many of you were here back in those 60s when he received those, that anointing, and he received, uh, you know, that message that the devil had been loosed and that we were living in the time when we will see the return of Jesus. I believe the message of Brother Thomas. I believe God called him to warn us that we are living near the day of the Lord when Jesus Christ will return again. I believe that. God has always warned his people when he was getting ready to do something. He warned, he warned Noah, this is the generation that will see the great flood. He warned Lot, this is the day Sodom and Gomorrah is going gonna, is gonna, to, this is the generation where that's going to be destroyed. When Jesus came, he told his generation, you are the generation that's going to see the destruction of your city and of your temple. And a million Jews died, but they were warned. And I believe, is God going to do any differently? Is he not going to warn the generation that's going to be alive in the day when Christ comes back again? I believe there are many here who are going to see the return of Jesus Christ in the sky. That's what I believe. Amen. Jesus says, just as you see a tree bud and you know summer is near, so too when you begin to see certain things, you will know that his coming is near. I believe Brother Thomas was one of those signs that God was warning, and I believe all over the earth, different places, different voices were raised up to alert God's people, Jesus is coming back again. Amen. You stay with God's people. Amen. You stay encouraged Amen. one another. Amen. You, let, you, you stay in this word. Yeah. This word has power to energize us and create an atmosphere Amen. around us. That's what we need because the enemy is after us. Right. We know that. He wants to take us down. He does not want us to see the King of Kings with joy and rejoicing. And so we read in Revelation 6 that what God is going to do before he comes again, and I believe that's where we're at right now, is we're going to begin to see a shaking. 
You know, we see what's going on in our country. We see what's going on in the world. But what's going on in the world isn't quite as, it's not as bad here as it is in the rest of the world. So we're kind of numb <clears throat> to how bad it really is in the world because we're here in America. But the forces of evil have been gathering around this country to bring this country down. Are you seeing it? Do you have eyes to see that? And God is going to permit it, I believe, in the right time. There's going to be a shaking, and it's going to scare people. But you and I need to be close to Jesus. We need to be in the Word of God so that we have a faith. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God, letting God speak to us, letting God prophesy to us, encouraging ourselves that God said there's going to be a shaking of the heavens and the earth. That's what it says in Hebrews 12. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken, that what might remain the kingdom of God will remain. And so this is what's going to remain. It's God's people. This is the kingdom of God right here. This is the body of Christ right here. And Christ is our head. Amen. There's no man as head of this body. Christ is the head of the body of Jesus Christ. And I thank God for that. That he's got elders and deacons that help the body of Christ. But there's only one who's the head. You have one leader. His name is Jesus. He's the head of this church. And he's going to take us through. Because he knows whether or not we have come to him for the forgiveness of our sins. And so you read here in the first 17 verses of Revelation chapter 6. And I just want to um, just point out the, the uh, verse 16. That when Jesus comes back again. And oh by the way what a day that's going to be isn't it? Can you imagine that day if we're alive and we see Jesus in the sky? Won't that, who, who can paint that? Who can paint Jesus with all the holy ones filling the whole heavens with his blazing glory, his blazing majesty? Oh, my goodness. Every eye will see him, folks, and that, that's real. I've had very little supernatural revelation, but one he gave me was a picture of him appearing in the atmosphere to the whole world, okay? And when he comes, when the people see this, what are they going to say? Verse 16, they're going to say to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come. Notice what it says there. Hide us from the face of the wrath of the Lamb. You notice the wrath there? There was wrath on the, on, the, on the world of Noah. There was wrath on Sodom and Gomorrah. There was wrath on Israel. And there will be wrath, God's anger against sin, in the day of the Lord. The wrath of the Lamb. This is what the Scripture says. We have to preach that the judgment day of God is approaching. People don't want to hear that. People do not want to hear that there's only one way to be saved. There's only one way that God has made available to sinners and the human race to escape death and to be able to stand before him. And that is through the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It says over here, if we go a little, he says, who is able to stand? And so we find that those who are able to stand are being sealed one, and I believe that's what's happening now. Those who have, who have come to Christ and asked for the full forgiveness of their sins and believes that their righteousness is given to them in the person of Jesus Christ, who is our righteousness. Right. And having Christ, I have all the righteousness I need right. to fellowship with a perfect, pure, and holy God. Right. Thank God for Jesus Christ. Right. He is my holiness. He is my righteousness. He gives me confidence to go boldly to a holy, pure God. Oh, if I tried to go myself, I could never even in a million years think I could fellowship with him. But having Christ, I know he says, you have my son. You have all the righteous enter into my presence because we have Jesus Christ. And so he's sealing different ones. This is a revelation given to us. We can't see that, but this is what God's doing. Just like God showed Ezekiel what God was doing before he destroyed his, uh, the nation of Israel the first time when he, he, he sent a man in the linen cloth out to mark those who would be saved, okay? The only one who knew what God was up to was Ezekiel because God revealed it to him. 
And so John is telling us God is going to be marking the ones who have truly and sincerely asked Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, who are truly trusting in him as their righteousness. And it says in verse chapter 7, well, let's start, start with verse 13. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes? And where do they come from? And I said, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. Now notice this. What enables them to come out of the great tribulation? And what enables them to stand in heaven? They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's all that it says. They've washed their lives with the blood of Jesus Christ, asking him for the fullness of forgiveness for anything we've ever done in our life and believing, as it was said last night, that God separates our sins as far as east is from the west. He casts them deep into the sea where we can never retrieve them again. He not only forgives us, but he has forgotten all of our sins and our transgressions. He's put them all away because he sees they were all atoned for in the Lamb of God slain on the cross of Calvary. And so here we are, you know, I believe at the end. There was 2,000 years from Abraham to Christ. Now from Christ, to, it's about 2,000 years. We're right there. And what the world doesn't want to hear is that there's only one way. They don't want to hear that. And there's another gospel in the church who want to allow other ways to get to heaven and to get to God. Okay? But listen, there's only one God. There's only one universe. There's only one way that this universe came into existence, right? That's the truth. All can agree on that. There's a universe and it came into existence. Now, how do you want to say it got into existence? Where did the universe come from? Okay, we believe because this book has been validated by the prophecies in it that God in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, and so there's only one universe. There's only one God that rules over this universe. And there can only be one savior. And there can only be one way. And it has to be through what God did through the Lamb of God on the cross. We cannot back off of that, folks. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but through me. And we got to hold that, friends, with brokenness. We got to hold that in love because that's a, people don't want to hear that there's just one way. But we've got to share that. That's what makes us, that's what gets us persecuted. That's what got Paul persecuted, the cross. But listen, the poisoned Israelites, there was only one way for them to be healed of their poisonous snake bite. They had to go to that bronze serpent on the pole and look and believe that by looking they would be cured of their poisonous snake bite, which represented sin. There was only one way for the Hebrews to save their firstborn from the judgment of God in Egypt. Come on now. They had to take the blood and they had to follow exactly what God told them to do. They couldn't just kill the lamb and throw it on the front steps and say, well, we killed the lamb. It's bleeding there. God says, no, I want you to take the blood. I want you to apply the blood on the lentils over the door. Do you think they did that? They were careful to do that. Because there was one way to save your kids from the judgment of God in Egypt. And I'm here to say there's only one way to stand in these last days when the Lamb comes in all of his anger and all of his wrath against sin and ungodliness and unrighteousness coming against Satan, coming as the high priest who's ministering in the Day of Atonement. Now, but soon, just like in the Day of Atonement, the high priest left his, his applying the blood. And they all waited for him to come out. Soon Jesus is coming out of the most holy place, out of his ministry. He's going to cease his ministry. And he's going to put on his warrior garments and he's going to come again. And there's only one way to stand. You have to be sealed. And it says those who have washed their garments in the blood of the Lamb, they are the ones who are going to... Who are these that come out of the great tribulation? They have trusted in the shed blood of the Lamb. 
Amen. That's our message to the world. God has provided for himself a lamb to forgive yes. us. Yes. And we need to tell the world, look, there aren't many roads to heaven. There's only one way. Amen. It sounds dogmatic, doesn't it? It sounds awful narrow. But there's only one truth, isn't there? There can only be one reality. You can't have five different realities. Okay, there's only got to be one way. If there's one God, there's only be one way to be saved. So let's not back off propitiation. I hope you have a Bible that has that word in there. <laughs> because when Paul put that in there, he says, look, that word is used by pagans to appease their angry deity. And the way that the pagan worshiper would appease their, their angry God and his wrath was to offer up their firstborn. So, so all the scholars say, how could Paul use a word like that? Because Paul didn't mean that. What Paul really was trying to say is, yes, God has to be appeased. The justice of God has to be satisfied. But it's not you and me offering up our firstborn or by our good works that can appease the wrath and anger of God against our sin. Because as John Stott likes to say, God has himself, has satisfied himself by offering himself for you and for me. Why? Because he loves you. Amen. He, he did that because he loves us. Amen. He did that because he loves us. And uh, I, I pray if there's anybody here tonight, I feel the Lord saying, Bob, invite someone here that may not have ever believed that Christ died for them. But tonight, maybe that's your, your night. Maybe tonight is your night mm -hmm. that you've never really bowed your head before Jesus. Mm -hmm. That you don't have, maybe you don't have peace with God. Maybe you've <laughs> never made contact with God. I knew I grew up in a, you know, just being afraid of God, never really making contact with God. I never thought God would ever love me. And uh, I went into the military and the Navy and came back. I was just as lost as I ever was. But somebody was praying for me. And uh, I started to wonder about things. I was a little older, I was 23. And... I prayed my first prayer. I said, God, are you there? And in that moment, when I sincerely sought the Lord, he saw me truly seeking him. He came to me, and I heard within me, I love you. <laughs> and I can't explain anything else but to say I believe God loved me in that moment. I was still a sinner in my sin. He didn't wait till I got myself right before he told me he loved me. When I was a filthy sinner, he said, Bob, I love you. And then I began to say, now what must I do to, to experience this love and, uh, and stay in this love and this atmosphere of love around me? And then I went to the church, and then people had patience with me uh, and my sin and my, my tobacco and alcohol and everything else. And finally, God took that all away. Praise God. But thank God the church, I, I believe they loved me. They accepted me. They saw God was working in me. There may be somebody here tonight that says, you know, I've always been kind of afraid of God. I've never really experienced God. I've never really encountered. I, don't, I, I, don't, I, I never really believe God loved me. I'm here to tell you tonight, if he could love me, he could love you. I know what kind of sinner I was. <laughs> It's been a long time since those days, but if I think back of what it was, I'm, I'm amazed at the grace of God that he would save a wretch like me. So I don't know how to do this, but if, if you want to bow your, let's bow our heads. And, and if there's someone here tonight that'd like to say, Brother Bob, I'm going to lift my hand up to and I'm going to ask you to pray for me. I, I need Jesus. I need him to help me turn from my sin. I need to, to, to have the faith to believe that he did die for all my sins. And that I can be forgiven. And that I can be saved. And that I can have the hope of heaven.